Okay. Thank you very much. Let's hope that this this remote session will work well until the end. Yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't join join you in Latvia, but uh, but uh, I'm sure we can handle this uh, also remotely from Finland. So for the next or the for, for the rest of the day, we will take a look at this uh, forestry tap processing platform. And uh, let me maybe share the screens already. I mean, the slides at this point. Yeah. So <clears throat> my name is Jukka Miettinen. I will be mostly talking and presenting for the rest of the day. But then we have also Lauri Seitsonen, who is our technical genius who will then talk to you about the of the developer perspective of the platform and we have of course Oleg who is with you there and can help if any kind of problems arise there so the idea for the rest of the day would be to <clears throat> first i would give you an overall presentation of what forestry tip is <clears throat> and what you can do with it. Then we have a coffee break. And uh, after that, we will get our hands on the platform itself. We will start with the short demonstration of the key features, and then we will have some exercises. And at the end of the day, Lauri will tell more about uh, the developer functionalities on the platform. And uh, I was I was happy to listen for the past 10, 10 to 15 minutes, Oleg's talking and I was thinking that these are exactly the, the kind of approaches that you can then implement into this platform. So in that sense, this is a good, good continuation <clears throat> or end for end of this day. Good. <clears throat> but then uh, a little bit of background first. I mean, we all know that uh, there are large global challenges ahead of us and forests play a big role in many of those. And uh, different types of uh, monitoring tools, more and more different types of monitoring tools are needed to be able to respond to the, the new requirements. Different kinds of uh, legislation, and uh, and uh, consumer pressure and whatever it is, this affects all forestry stakeholders, whether it's a international organization or or government administration or private companies. We have more and more obligations and and desire to monitor forests on high frequency and different types of aspects of forests and uh, at the same time the amount of data that we have to use to 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 do this monitoring is rapidly increasing uh, first of all of course as we are now here in the isa session there are all the satellite data sets i mean the the, the amount of the volume of satellite data available has really exploded over the past 10 years. But this is not all. In addition, we have different types of airborne sensors. We have increasing amount of field measurements, which are not anymore always measured actually in the traditional way by hand, but they may also be coming from various sensors actually on the ground. We have crowdsourced data we have weather, weather, climate data, and different types of uh, geographical data sets. So, so the amount of data is overwhelming nowadays. <clears throat> and uh, if we talk about, if we are thinking about satellites, particularly important nowadays for forest monitoring, are the the Sentinel especially one and two, but also to some extent Sentinel-3 satellite. 
and uh, these sentinel one and two alone they produce like uh, global coverage in every few days in 10 meter resolution so you can imagine that there is uh, there is incredible amount of of data and to handle all this data we need this kind of platform remote platforms there is no way anybody can nowadays <clears throat> take full benefit of all the existing data sets by downloading the data into his pc so for this reason we have these uh, various different types of <clears throat> of platforms and uh, the the image we can see here it's uh, it's the ESA's uh, vision on on this data and <clears throat> and processing platforms so at the bottom bottom level we have the data generation level basically whether it comes from ESA or from from other uh, other sources they may be international or or, or national satellites and uh, on top of that we have then the what is called resource tier layer which is basically the the storage and distribution platforms and uh, here in this layer we have uh, several national i mean many many countries have their own distribution or several distribution centers but most importantly here we have the copernicus dias platforms the data and information access system platforms or services and uh, on top of these we then have the service layer which is basically the layer that allows the users to access and uh, and benefit from these data sets and um, if you you notice that in this platform service layer there is the tep which are the thematic exploitation platforms initiated by ESA a few years ago. And one of those is forestry TEP. So this it's really, we are talking about forestry TEP today and we will demo the platform, but, uh, but these similar kind of approaches and methods and tools you find also in, in many other platforms. So, in the in the right hand side here you can see how forestry tip then is uh, is positioned in this in this pyramid or or, or network so forestry tip for example it physically sits on one of the dioceses it's in a, one of the dioceses called trio dias it's in poland and this forestry tip platform which is sort of an interface to the forestry users for this dias sits on that DS. And the idea is that uh, in Forestry TEP, the users can find then these applications, uh, whether it's from Forestry TEP or VTT uh, or the uh, some third party users. So the idea is that the Forestry TEP platform would sit like in between the data and service providers and the users. So the forestry tip and this type of platforms would be the, the avenue or the interface for the users to access and, and benefit from all that big amount of data. The forestry tip platform is, uh, is uh, coordinated by VTT <clears throat> But uh, the, there are many, like I said, there are many other platforms available as well. Uh, we have user registered users from, from I would say, all over the world actually. But uh, number wise, the dominated, I mean, uh, concentrated in Europe, naturally. And uh, we will have a look at the both the website and the platform very soon, actually. But uh, just a glimpse of, of what it looks like here. Good. So what you can do, how you can benefit then, from, or how generally a user can benefit from, from Forestry Tep. There are two, basically two basic ways 
to use it, first of all. One is to use the available applications that are already on the platform to combine the EO data and other data sets that are there and potentially also your own data sets. You can upload your own data sets there and you can use the existing applications there without bringing all the necessary data to your computer. Uh, another way to use it and and which is then the way that really unleashes the, the power is to develop your own processing scripts. So if you have your own processing scripts that you like to work on your computer, you can then implement those into this platform and you have access, you can run them through the whole CreaDS database, what is available there. And further on, you can, if you want also then to share these processing scripts with other users, or if, if you think they have commercial value, you can license them. And uh, similarly, you can share products if you want and so on, but this is all up to you, up to the user then. Uh, also, there are two different modes of usage. So the primary way for beginners especially is the online web interface. This is the interface that we will soon have a look and this is the interface that we will try today. But, but there is also a, a direct machine to machine connection, this REST API uh, through which you can contact the, the platform directly from your own system. I will talk about, I will tell more about that in a moment. Uh, and then, so what are the processing services and tools available on the platform? Well, we can group those into three basic categories. Basically, we have what we call these thematic processing services, which means that they produce, you can produce some kind of products like vegetation indices, for certain interest area or land cover mapping or forest change mapping. And then there are also what we call supporting processing services, which are more like pre-processing of satellite data sets. These are typically uh, stacking of different images together or mosaicing them or, or masking, doing radiometric correction and these kinds of things. And then the third quite interesting aspect is that we have also these uh, interactive applications like QGIS and SNAP. So you can, you can use QGIS directly on the platform, like have a remote session on the QGIS without having any software installed in your own computer. Uh, you can find more on these on the website, but we will have a, <clears throat> have a look at that also soon. Uh, then there is the service development interface, which I already mentioned, which allows you to implement your own processing scripts into the platform. And this, uh, you may be aware of other platforms like Google Earth Engine, which has the JavaScript and, and Python APIs so this is basically similar, similar but different approach in the sense that uh, in most platforms, the languages, the, the programming languages and, the, and the, the syntax and everything is, is very much regulated by the platform. In Forest Retep, it's slightly different in the sense that this uh, developing interface is based on the, on the Docker uh, approach. So, which means that you can quite easily use any, basically almost any programming language that you prefer to use. So if you have your own scripts already existing, it should be possible to implement those into Forest Retep because you can define the programming language yourself and then only at the end, the Docker image is, is built and that is then used to run the process in, 
in, in the platform. And uh, all of these that I mentioned that you can use the SNAP and, and uh, QGIS and Orpheo toolbox, all these libraries are also available for the, for the developer on the platform. Okay, and then yes, then there is the the REST API approach, like I said, which you can access directly from your own system. So most importantly, if you have created a service into the platform, you can then access this service, run the 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 job that it does, and retrieve the output data back to your own system without even visiting the online interface at all. So this is how most of our like uh, large processing tasks, uh, I would say high volume users, this is how they use the platform actually. Uh, but this also, Lauri will tell much more about this in the, in the developer section. And uh, yeah, so if you are interested in after this evening or after this session, if you are interested in trying the platform, the, the easiest way I would say, and the most users we have, they are project users. So you can utilize this kind of uh, cloud platform in your projects. We, for example, here in, in VTT, we have had a long list of projects already for the past five years, which at some point have used more or less this forestry tip processing facilities. And we are happy to partner, of course, in this kind of projects. So this is the most typical, typical way that especially researchers come into using these kinds of platforms. But then of course, if you later, for example, set up uh, some kind of startup and have ideas. You have a script that you think that could have commercial value, but you don't have a distribution channel or, or platform. This is another example where, where this kind of platform could, could become useful for you. So we have the platform, we have the visual interface, we have the community. So this might be a good way to, to implement then the this kind of new ideas into practice. Good. Uh, some examples of ongoing uh, activities. So what is happening on the platform? Uh, like I said, we have had many projects over the past year. Here, a few largest ones are listed. So we, for example, had the EU project called Forest Flux. Its main processing platform was this forestry tip. And we had uh, last year, we had the ISA project called the Forest Digital Twin Precursor. Similarly, they used the forestry tip as the processing platform. And now we have an ongoing large ISA project called the Forest Carbon Monitoring, which in a way continues or takes further the the lessons learned from the forest flux project. And in, in, in this uh, forest carbon monitoring project, we are building this kind of a prototype of a forest carbon platform where we could be, would be able to use different combinations of satellite data and different combinations of processing methods based on the user needs. And again, Forestry TEP is the demonstration platform where all the processing will happen. And the benefit of this kind of projects for the platform itself is that, or, or the other users also of the platforms, is that the, within these projects, new approaches or new services are developed and are implemented into the platform. And many of these then become usable also for the users. Uh, some examples of uh, 
the kind of uh, services or, or applications yeah you, you might be confused with that terminology this uh, these applications they are called officially services in the in the forestry tech platform but basically they are they are applications or or software tools and uh, one of the applications that we have for example is this vtt developed auto change which is quite highly used unfortunately it's not available for all users because it's a licensed licensed software but this has been used in uh, in many of the of the projects that i just mentioned and it's a it's a change detection algorithm works on image to image type of change detection but the the key issue or the 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 key point of this is that it does not directly compare the spectral values of these two images. But <clears throat> what it does is that it creates clustering in the first image, and then it compares how homogeneous those clusters are still in the second image. And that basically that is how it then derives the, the changed areas and the change magnitude and different types of changes. And the benefit of this is that, as we all know, there are inter-image variations. I mean, the images may vary, the spectral level may vary slightly for atmospheric reasons, or even more so for, for example, seasonal reasons. And uh, this approach is quite robust against that kind of changes because it looks into the those areas that were homogeneous in the first image it looks those areas in the second image and evaluates whether they are homogeneous or not regardless of how similar they look to the first image uh, another approach that is widely used in the platform is this uh, probability i don't know if oleg has mentioned no. this actually during the day already but it's again a, a vtt developed approach an empirical method to estimate forest structure variables like height or diameter <clears throat> and it has uh, a few steps it starts with the clustering and then it combines the field data the reference data information to the clusters and creates a model based on that and then it estimates for each pixel the estimated value looking into how probable it is for that pixel to belong to any of these or it, some of these clusters so it uses the 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 average of the clusters weighed by the probability of how probable it is to belonging to that cluster and this this probability has been then used also in the carbon monitoring by combining it with process-based ecosystem modeling. So what we do, what we did in the forest flux and what we do again in the forest carbon monitoring is that we first use the probability to estimate the forest structure variables. Then we use those as input to this ecosystem modeling, which then provides us with the carbon flux, in information on carbon fluxes, like basic information like biomass, but then also estimation of the net primary production or gross primary production and this kind of variables. <clears throat> Good. And yes, we have the website for more information. Let's go actually to look, can you now see my the, the website screen? Yes. Good. Yeah, so we can have a look very briefly. <clears throat> so when you start then using, using the platform, you can find basically all information from, from this website. So in the landing page, there are more like general kind of information on the on the platform. Then in the offering page you can find listing of all the 
services. Notice here, they're called services, like I mentioned, the different kinds of applications that we have on the platform and, and short descriptions of those. Uh, and then on the subscription page, you can find information on what the different kinds of packages are. And as you notice, this is not a, a free platform, but don't be too worried about that because there are different ways of actually applying for funds for using this platform, particularly if you are using it for research projects. There is this uh, ESA Network of Resources initiative, which I don't know if it has been mentioned already or will be mentioned this week. That has been running several years already. And then there is this uh, also from EU, this OCRE, Open Clouds for Research Environment Initiative, which is actually the call is open right now for applications. And, uh, and then you have, we have this uh, news, news and outreach page for more information. But most importantly, and which is where I want to finish, is the, the registration and support page. So this is the page where you can find, first of all, information how to start using the platform. And then when you start using it, information on specific details like the user manual and, and uh, service development and some, some short short tutorial videos. And uh, now I would like to make sure that everybody has, has everybody registered into this uh, ESA EO sign-in system? If anybody, if someone has not registered yet, then you have still the 30 minutes time to do that, which is more than enough. It's quite a simple process because the, the login to the platform happens through <clears throat> or using this EO sign-in account. So that's it actually. Yeah, I think what time is it? It's already, yeah, well, it's perfect. It's, it's three o'clock. So, so in my mind of, Unless you have questions now, we ha can have some short questions if you want. If not, we can have a break now and those who have not registered yet could register. And then after half an hour, we could start actually looking and handling the platform itself. So if we continue from the page where we left on the website, or actually it's on every page, this platform button, even on the front page, fdep.com, you can find this platform button and you can try to click it and see what happens. If you end up with this kind of screen, okay, it was short, but sometimes the trial stays there longer because it, you may have something in the cache, it doesn't recognize you, then you, you could push the refresh button. But, but uh, anyway, when you try to log in, this is the screen that you should end up, the EO sign-in screen. And there you can then use your EO credentials and password. And by the way, if you do not have those yet from the same screen, you could have then went on and, and registered. And then when you click the login, I mean, the, the hit enter, you should end up in either this kind of screen or the white box that I just, that just briefly you saw there asking you to start a trial. If you have never visited this platform before, it will ask you to start a trial. So then you can click that. That's 30 days free use. And uh, when, if everything has worked well, you should be 
seeing this kind of map background at this point. Is there, how did it work? I mean, is there anybody having trouble getting in? So I, I, I understand most of you have gotten yeah, like in. 90% are in. Okay, so. great. Maybe let's let's go ahead because what I want to do first anyway is to to mainly show go through the key interfaces and explain a few things. So at this point you don't need to do anything. It might be good actually that you wouldn't do anything, but <laughs> more follow follow and listen. And then only in about twenty minutes or so we start actually doing the exercises. <clears throat> so. Yeah, so like I said, this is the interface where you end up, and this is called the Explorer interface. So the Explorer interface is where most of the action happens. And we will come back to this interface in a short while, but I will just show you briefly what the other interfaces are in this platform. So first of all, if we start from the very end, we have the, the help desk. So what happens if you click here, you actually end up into the same web page where you have that information. Uh, log out, don't click that until you're done. Then there is the My Account interface. You can find information on your account. I'm also logged in with the trial subscription now, so we can see, we should see exactly the same same thing, so there is basic information when your subscription started and so on and so on. And your username and also I mentioned the REST API access. <clears throat> so if you need to use that, you have to create the, the key. You can use the key here or create the key here that you need to use then to, to allow the access. But then more important interface is this uh, manage and share interface because uh, this is where you can uh, manage groups, for example. A group, a group is a important concept in Forestry Tep, because if you want to share your work, if you want to share your services, or if you want to share your outputs or your reference data with other people, it all happens through this group concept. So, you can create a group for yourself here, and then you can add members into that group. We will actually do this later today. Uh, but the groups are not the only things you can manage here. <clears throat> there are also, you can create projects if you work on, on different data sets or, or different topics, you can create different topics for yourself. You can manage your data baskets. Data basket is another important concept in Forestry Tep. It is basically a collection of data sets that you want to use. Typically in some project you want to use or you choose to use, let's say 10 to 100 satellite images. So you can all, you can collect them to these data baskets and then handle them within the data baskets. So you can see the what data baskets you have and what kind of files you have in them. And we will, again, we will create a data basket later today. Uh, you can see your own jobs that you have been running, meaning the different types of, of uh, processing applications that you have run. You can see the details the inputs, outputs, and logs of these jobs here. Uh, there is the systematic processing. I will jump over that because that's a bit more advanced system. But uh, also you can see all the services that you have, all the applications that you have access to. And you can, for example, share them if you have the rights and so on. And finally, you can also, you have the, there's also a files tab where you could see your own files, what you have. But in fact, we have nowadays a better file interface 
which is this it's called files it's one of the the tabs at the at the top so that is a better place to look at all your files and not only your files but all the files that you have access to meaning that for example if you are in a group and someone shares a file within that group this is the place you could see that and then you could see the the details of the file and you can for example download the file in your into your own computer if you want you can search for the files and most of all on the left hand side here this is an important button this upload button so one of the the key benefits of these kinds of platforms is that the satellite data and all the other data that is there on the creodias that is accessible to you but then you can combine that with your own data by uploading your own data so if you want to upload your own data into the platform you can click this plus button and then just drag drag and drop the the file here and click this upload button this feature we will not try today actually uh, and then there is the developer interface, which is uh, for more advanced than advanced use, like I said, uh, if you want to implement your own services. But it's also a good place to, to see how these other services, most of the services here, which are open, open to use, they also, you can see the codes here all the files so if you want to develop or when you want to start to develop your own service you can see how the other services have been created and, and copy those concepts so that is a it is a good source of material good but now let's go back to the the main <clears throat> main page main place so the explorer interface and uh, here on the right hand upper right hand you have this navigation basic navigation buttons you can for example draw polygon or you can draw a different type of polygon and you can clear those polygons or you can edit the polygon but you can see the the actual coordinates and you can if you want you can edit the shape of the polygon like that and, uh, <clears throat> and you can copy the polygon to clipboard which, which means that if you click this button you will get this string into your clipboard and then paste it i will show later where it can be useful for example or or you can clear the clear the whole screen back to its original position. Of course, there is zoom in and out. You can also zoom in and out by your, with your mouse easily with the, the scroll button. And, and on the top upper left, you can choose what kind of background you want to have. If you want to have an, an open street map or, or just a satellite image or what is the this satellite and the street map is the default good but these are just the like navigation buttons on the left hand on the other hand we have the main features so starting on the left hand on the top you have the search features so if you click the search button you this kind of panel will open and you can see that you can search either satellite data, you can search reference data or the FTEP products. And the terminology goes so that the FTEP products are the outputs of jobs that have been run in forestry TEP. Reference data is a bit confusing. It, here it means all data that has been uploaded by the users, then it's considered reference data. The satellite data, on the other hand, is the, well, it's what it's called. <laughs> it's the satellite data available in Creodias, basically. And, uh, and if you want to search, you, you can then choose the, the sensor, 
for example, Sentinel-2, you can choose the dates here and uh, the cloud coverage, and you need to choose the level. And of course, most importantly, you need to use this polygon tool now to choose an area. And then you can hit the search button and uh, this uh, data panel opens at the bottom showing the results of your search. And as you can see, when you scroll down or, or go through the, the list, you can see where the, where the file actually is. Let's see if we have some, this one, for example, and you can see the cloud coverage here, but most of all, by clicking this info button here, you can see a quick look or a browse image of the scene. And also uh, all the other metadata information that is, is in the file itself. Good. And then we, we will try this, uh, we will, try this search function soon on a real situation. But then if we continue down from the search, the next one is services. So this is where you can find the applications. And now all the, you can see those applications that you have rights to. So again, if someone creates an application and shares it with you, then this is the place where you can see it. This, for example, here in VTT, we use this uh, very much this platform exactly the way that uh, we have our own internal research group. And whatever services or applications we need to use, then our service developers <clears throat> create the services and then share it with the whole group. So then all the all us researchers can use the services through this platform. And like I said, there are different types of services. We will have a closer look later, for example, in this tree cover density service. Then there is uh, Envimon, which is a pre-processing tool for satellite data. If you, use, if you want to use Sentinel to level one or two images, for example, but you would want to have them in TIFF. Instead, you could run it through this Envimon, or you can do cloud masking with uh, FMask, or there are a lot of uh, different types of GTAL tools already implemented here. And also, these are good examples of how, if you want to implement some other GTAL tool, how you could do that. And then, Sentinel-2 processing tools and vegetation indices is a very basic tool, but that's what we will later use as in, the, in one of our demos. And you can find from the same service page, you can also find then the, the GIS and, and SNAP, the, what we call application services. Good. And then if you want to, when you want to use some service and uh, for example, I will use this example, vegetation services, and you click that, it will open in the, in the workspace. And, and this is the place, it's the next button down on the left, it's called the workspace. Uh, this is the place where you then enter the required parameters. And this now, the, how it looks here, it depends entirely on the service developer. I mean, what kind of uh, parameters do the, each services need? It varies and some have different types of modes like this one, for example, has the, the so-called basic mode where you don't need to give any specific images to it. And then the so-called advanced mode where you actually give them an image to it where you want to create it. Uh, we will try that later. And then last but not least is the data panel button. 
and this is the where the let's say the platform communicates with the user through this plat this uh, panel first of all there is this expand button on the on the right hand side right next to the croc so if you if you click that you it will it will get bigger and in this data panel you can find results any kind of if you do any researches you can find the results here uh, also you can go through your data baskets so you can see what data baskets you have and uh, what files you have in there i wonder why i don't see now or well, maybe it doesn't have any. Okay, there it goes. It was a bit slow. Yeah, so you can see what kind of files you have in there. And you can edit the data baskets, the names and descriptions and, and so on. And you can see also you can this I button here, you can load to map is this when it would show you where those files actually are but was this uh, ah this may not be a suitable example for that yes okay and then we have in the data panel also we have the the jobs Layer. So you can see all the all the jobs, all the applications that you have run, basically. And for each of those, you can see here the, the inputs, what has been used, and the outputs, and the log of the process. And you can also see here details of the when it started, for example. <clears throat> and uh, and when it ended and here an important button again if you want to now share this job with the uh, with other users you can click this share button and choose a, gr a group that you want to share it with and even more important button this edit and rerun button so if you want to change some parameter you want to use the, the you want to run the same job but you would want to just try it with another parameter. You can click this edit and rerun and uh, it will open again in the, in the workspace and you can easily just change the parameters you want and then run it. Uh, yeah, this is a very simple service, this, this tree cover density. So we can see the inputs here and we can see the outputs. and we can see the logs there is some slowness now clearly in the platform it's usually a bit faster it may be because there are 40 or 35 people doing the same same things at the same time anyway the the logs are visible here then after so if you have some if you run into some problems with the running you can check the log and see where it where it ended what happened good but i think the best way to learn is by doing so let's let's all try something <clears throat> and uh, the first thing i what we could do is a very simple vegetation index calculation just to to so that you can see how you run these forestry tech processing services search an image and uh, and run a processing service so what we will do is uh, in three steps basically we search a suitable sentinel 2 image in this case it needs to be level 1c because this this service eats level 1c data you can choose uh, some forest, forested area, perhaps, or up to you. 
And then we run the vegetation indices service and we see the results on the screen. So let's start. We can close this panel for now. And the first step we need to do is to search for the nice satellite image. So we open the search window. And if you haven't already chosen the satellite search, you can click the satellite button so that it opens the satellite search. And we need Sentinel-2 image as it is. You can specify the time. Let me take, for example, last summer. You can specify the time by <clears throat> either just inputting, putting your cursor here and inputting the numbers or by choosing the, the date from the calendar here. And then the polygon. Now you need to use the polygon tool, which you could find from the upper right corner. And you can create a search polygon. Let's try somewhere in Latvia, for example. And when you create this polygon here, it, you may have noticed it automatically inputs the, the string here. In some services, it might not do it. So that's why now that you have created the polygon, you could click this uh, copy to clipboard button here, and then you could control V paste it, it on the on the AOI box. Then you can specify the, the cloud cover. Let's try to get very cloud free images. And the lever is correct. So then we just hit this pink button. Now it works. So, so that's good. Uh, yeah. Let's see, for example, this one, how does it look? The yeah, cloud coverage is close to zero. That is zero. That's very good. And there is a nice forest area here. At least for me, I can use this image. You can similarly choose whatever image you want to use. <clears throat> and uh, you can basically leave it as it is now. So you just click the one of the files and uh, it gets sort of selected. Then if we have selected the scene, we can then close this search button and open the service. So it, you should find it on the first page and the, somewhere near the bottom, this uh, vegetation indices is the service called. And uh, when you click it, then left click once, it will open on the workspace. And now, because we want to run it specifically for one file, we click the so-called advanced mode. And there, <clears throat> if you start looking the, the parameters, the first one is the input data. So here you can very easily, if you go, you should still see the results in the, in the, in the panel, you can just see the, where the double line is here to the left of the file name, there it says there drag result. You can click your left button or push down your mouse left button and drag the file directly to the input data where you can see that the cursor changes. You see that first it has the, as the like the prohibition <laughs> uh, sign, but then it changes into the arrow. There you can drop it and it automatically goes as the input file into the into the the workspace and then you could choose different kinds of vegetation indices we can choose ndv well you can choose what you want i will choose ndvi <clears throat> and then there is this area of interest parameter and this i recommend using now because it makes the process faster so you can now use again the, the polygon tool. So you choose the polygon and then let's see where the forest area was here. Then you can draw a small polygon somewhere within the scene that you can use. And uh, now you have two options. 
when you have created the polygon, you can either click this uh, copy polygon on clipboard and then paste it here on the area of interest. Or you can directly click this after area of interest parameter. There is this copy from map button where my cursor is now. You can click that and the polygon appears into the parameter list. Then we can only enter the output pixel space and give some name to the job so that we can find it easily later. And then hit again the pink launch button. So now you could push the, the manage and share interface tab in the, in the upper bar. And when you reach there, you may or may not have this groups panel already open. If you do not have it open, you can find it here at the top on the left hand side groups. If you push that, it will open. And then at the bottom of that, you have the, the plus button, create a new group. So you can click that. And uh, you can give whatever name to your group. What kind of groups I have already, Latvian demo group let's give it like this and you can give a description if you want that this is a group of your colleagues or a group of some specific project or whatever but you don't need to give that and then just hit create and then it should appear on the groups list And at least for me, it did appear. How is it for you? If you then click the whatever group you created, you can see the details of the group. You can see who are the users and how it's shared. <clears throat> uh, it fine. If you look at the screen now, if you see this kind of scene that your your job that you started and then you would have an output if you click the output tab those of you who can see it like this you can click the well first of all you can clear the screen by clicking the clear map here on the on the right hand side and then if you click this uh, layer image the show WMS layer <clears throat> you can see your output on the screen in this case the NDVI output for the area that you chose and you can zoom in in and out let's let's go ahead and uh, what we could do, I'm wondering, I was, and press many times. I was thinking yeah, yeah. to have three exercises, but, uh, but, but I think we can skip the number two and you can maybe do this on your own in the coming days or tonight. So this exercise two was about to be the, oh, Okay, let's do it like this. Let's do this exercise two still together. And then I will just demo the exercise three alone at the end. And uh, you can do that maybe later. Because this is, I, I like this actually, this <laughs> Copernicus land monitoring service. So, so the, in the previous one, we used the satellite image, but in Creodias, there are also other types of data sets available. One, is the or one type of data sets are the, the Copernicus services outputs. So there are, you, you may be aware of those, there are many different types of products. For example, there are these European high resolution layers, which include forestry layers. And among those forestry layers, there is this tree cover density product 
for example. And uh, if you have used those before, you, you may know that they are available publicly, easily you can download them, but it's not that simple. If you are working on a specific area, you would you always have to download the data sets and, and mosaic them and cut them for your area and so on. So for that reason, there is a simple tool in forestry tip to extract the tree cover density product for your interest area. And this is what we, we will do now. So you can leave actually this uh, job view as it is because we will need this output of the previous job but other than that we need to go to the services tab again and it's at the very top this uh, clms tree cover density service so if you click that it should open on the workspace but it still has the at least i have the vegetation indices take some time perhaps now i have this the tree cover density in the workspace does everybody have it as well i hope soon at least <clears throat> and then you can see what kind of parameters it would need if so you can create it for any any area of interest polygon that you create and you then you would have to specify the the projection and the resolution and all but we are now interested in getting it exactly for our study area which is this area that we used in the previous so what we can do we can use this aoi image option so if you have the output from your previous vegetation indices job again you just drag it like this to the aoi image parameter box and drop it there and i think i used 20 meter resolution for the vegetation indices product so i will put the same here but uh, you can use whatever you used <clears throat> And then we we'll just label. And hit the launch button again. And now don't worry if you don't see it right away. Don't push it again. I think it will appear soon. You can, in fact, after you have hit the, the launch button, you can close this uh, workspace entirely. At least I have now the new job on my job list. Okay, those of you who whose job has finished and you can again see the output like this here now if you again click the the show layer button it will now show the the tree cover density product for your interest area so it's now exactly the same dimensions as the as the vegetation indices product and by the way i didn't mention it yet so you can download all of these outputs easily to your own computer if you want from here <laughs> i suggest that uh, okay. i will show you okay. the what we were planning to do for the third exercise and you can do this in the evening if you are interested so in the third exercise we were about to create a data basket and then open it in a QGIS service. So now, for example, <clears throat> this output product, it looks nice and OK here because it has a specific specified look for the colors. But the, as you notice, the NDVI doesn't look that good here in this view. And then 
also you may want to analyze them further in QGIS, for example. So the easy way to do this is to, first of all, to create a data basket. Uh, actually, you don't even need to go to the data basket tab. You can create it here on the jobs tab. There is a shopping cart with the plus sign that if you push that, you can create a new data basket. Let's say Latvia 5, because I don't remember how many of these I have already created while testing. And uh, <clears throat> we can then select that our specific data bus there it goes and then i can choose that latvia 5 as my so-called active data basket <clears throat> and then <clears throat> if i want to put for example the output product from this this tree cover density job i will go into the output and click it to make it active and as you noticed this button activated, which is the add to data basket button. In this case, add to Latvia 5. So I can just click that and it should be added to Latvia 5. And I can do the same for the vegetation indices output. So when I go to the vegetation indices output, uh, sorry, vegetation indices job and uh, wait for a moment now that i mean in normal conditions when i use this this all happens in half a second now it takes five to ten seconds for some reason but uh, again i will choose activate it and i will click the add to latvia 5 data basket and now if i go to the data baskets tab I should see, I hopefully soon see the two files here. At least I can see my Latvia 5 basket here. And then if I want to use the <clears throat> that data basket directly as an input to a QGIS service, I can now choose the QGIS service from here. Let's take the QGIS3 and it opens it in, in the workspace. Uh, anyway, when you have all the files in the data basket that you want to, you can just uh, grid the whole drag, sorry, the whole data basket from here. Uh, the drag data basket button, you can drag that as input to the QGIS service. And now you can see that uh, the data basket is here. By the way, I can show you here the, the, the what is important here when you, perhaps this was the issue. So last time, for someone uh, you you can see now my cursor here it has the the kind of uh, cross on top of the the par here you cannot drop it but uh, here when it changes into these kind of two lines then you can then it's in the right spot and you can drop it and then it gets selected there okay and then another important point in this qgis and all application services that there is this timeout because when we when we start the <clears throat> when we start the process uh, it will start the it will start it will open the the session in a way and you you can specify the time out time for that session and this was originally created so that uh, so because uh, you can terminate the job if you want but if you just close the the browser window you will see soon soon see how we see it it won't terminate the job actually so there was a danger that this kind of qgis jobs would continue running 
forever on the platform if people don't specifically terminate them. And that's why there is this timeout. But beware of this timeout. If you put 10 minutes or so, it is really, it, it ends the job then. So if you haven't finished your whatever you wanted to do, then you lose everything if you haven't saved them by that time. Okay, when after you have clicked this button here, then this job, the QGIS jobs appear on the job list again. And after a moment, this kind of arrow go to graphical user interface appears. This is not visible at the at the start when you when you click the button. You have to in normal conditions you have to wait for a few seconds. Now it might have taken a bit longer, but there it is. And now if you click this button, it opens in another browser window a remote session of QGIS three in this case. And it should come visible very soon. I wonder what the issue is. Server disconnected. Sorry, this is an issue with the cookies. Okay, so you mean I have to clear it's my sometimes, history? Yes, it sometimes does this and then clearing FTP cookies helps and then it refresh this window and then refresh this window first. Okay. Yeah, I need to log in. Good. Well, this is not good. Mm. Usually this happens, or if this happens, it disappears in a few seconds. There it goes. And the benefit of that, like I just told you, it, it won't stop the, the process running. The benefit of this is exactly what we just witnessed here. So, so the, even after these kind of manipulations and logging out and logging in, the service was still running. So I could now jump directly into the QGIS. And uh, so as you can see now, I have on my browser QGIS window and I can work here as is as if this was on my computer. And then I can save the products. If, if I want to save something, it needs to be saved here in the output directory. And I could save here the Latvia project, for example. And then I when I am finished, I can just terminate this and I can terminate the job here. And after it's properly terminated, then I can see the output products of that job in this outputs. Good. Okay, in that case, I will I will leave the stage for Lauri, who has already helped us with the technical issues on the background, but he will tell you now about the developer developer interface. Let me unshare somehow this. Stop share. I think now you should be able to share Lauri. Yes. We can see your screen. Okay, and hopefully you can hear me as well. <clears throat> yes, we can. 
Okay, so all FTP users have this developer tab where the services are defined. And the services, it, it helps if you have some basic understanding of Docker and Linux and that kind of stuff. But if not, don't be afraid. Copy and paste are very common tools in this. It seems that we have this server slowness again. So the service is defined first in the Docker file. You define the running environment for the software. For example, in this example service, which runs GDAL info, we start from Ubuntu 18.04, install the required packages, install some FTP utility wheel for Python, which helps to manage the input parameters for the services. Uh, Lauri, is it only me or I can't still see your, the developer? It is frozen to the, the screen is frozen to the map view. Okay, it decided to, Okay, yeah, pause my sharing, it seems. Okay, yeah, now 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 we can see the right yeah. screen. Yeah, this is the okay. developer interface. Oh so so this is the Docker file where you define the Linux environment for the software to run. And the entry point to the pro service is this workflow.sh script, where in this case, this is modified from a template which gives all these already. We can, I, I normally put these rows here to print debugging information. It's, it's easier to debug the system if you, you know, can see the versions and that kind of things. And here I simply call my Python script and check its return value. And the Python script uses our FTP utility library to manage the parameters of the service. So this service is defined in three files. And in addition to that, we need to define the inputs, the parameters of the service and the output or outputs. And here we have a tick box mount full EO data which means that the CreoDIAS environment makes available all the data in a network share. And it's a folder structure from which you can find all the Sentinel data, for example, if you know where it is. And you can find the direct file paths from the metadata when you search for the images and open the metadata you can actually see the slash eo data slash da 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 path of the files and with that you can reverse engineer for example if you want to make a service that you for which you give two dates and an aoi and then it processes all the images within that time period, for example. But because this time is now quite limited, so, okay, when you create a service, you click a plus button here, give a name, which should not contain anything but letters and 
numbers title which is a normal text and uh, short i think it was 255 character description accept the terms and click create but because probably most of you won't remember from this few minutes all the details in the help desk we have the service developer guide and links to some other documentation. And the service developer guide goes through all the phases of the service development, creating the service, defining the files, inputs, outputs, and also act, handles the, covers these more sophisticated features like templated service parameters, which means that you can create a service that can have two different parameter sets, one for standard users, one for advanced users, and that gives the possibility to define the defaults for these hidden parameters for the standard users. The systematic processing, the service can be defined so that it run, executes, it's executed for all new images on a certain area for, for a certain time period. period. And after you have created the service and tested it, found it acceptable, you can share it to other users or you can publish it. And that happens in the manage share tab of the portal. And find the services and then Click the share and select the group with which to share, share the service. And you can define whether it's the level is service user, so the other people can just use the service, or whether they can, as a service to read only developers, they can see the source codes for the service. As a service developer, they can actually modify the code and the service operator is the kind of administrator level access to the service. And then there's also a possibility to publish services with this request publication, after which the FTEP administrators need to accept the request before the service is made public. But this service developer guide contains also some code samples. For example, how to download binary files in the Docker file. How to, what, what's needed to create a service that uses Python and GDAL, which are quite common tools. And if you are using R, how to, what kind of packages need to be installed. And then there's the link to this utility, utility library to make things easier. And about these helper tools we have for the REST API, it's a bit tricky. And although the documentation says that you can use the token to access directly the REST API, it requires currently a valid sign, single sign on session, which makes it a bit tricky to use from scripts. But if you are using Python, we have a library with, which makes it easy to use. 
So you just open the API with the user name and password, and then you can use all the API methods. And this is a working progress. So we are adding more options to this package as when the users request something. So if you need something, please ask. Okay, I think I used my 10 minutes. <laughs> Good. Oh, okay, so if, it seems that there are no questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Yuka, uh, uh, Oleg, and uh, your, all your team for the interesting lecture. Um, Thank you. I hope that you can uh, accept to get uh, uh, questions and contacts by email in the next days if people are interested, and I think that they are, because uh, uh, forestry is an important uh, subject uh, for Latvia and for Baltic countries. So I hope that this uh, lecture and this, and this course is also an opportunity to develop um, partnerships between uh, your uh, team and the participants. Otherwise, thanks again, and uh, uh, then, uh, sorry, you cannot see me. Where the camera is there, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thanks uh, to all the team of VTT and uh, for the participants. We meet tomorrow again at 8:30. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It was great to see you all. Bye. Bye bye. Bye, bye Yuka. Bye, Lauri.